The Great War Western Front doesn't have an overtly complex user interface, but nonetheless, there is still a lot going on. So in today's video, we're going to take a dive into everything that's going on within the game from that user interface, user experience standpoint to uh, help you understand some concepts and mechanics a little better. Now, first and foremost, I do want to say that the tutorial itself that's built into the game is pretty extensive and will cover a lot of the things that I am going to as well. But sometimes people just enjoy hearing things from a person instead of just reading walls and walls of text, or perhaps you're stuck on a certain thing or want to understand something that's a little bit different. So that's my job today. I do hope you enjoy it. Let's dive right on in. And first and foremost, I do want to mention that I am in the the later start of the campaign, this is May of 1916. You can start in December of 1914 or May of 1916. And we are in this one because it does push us a little further forward to access some information that isn't necessarily going to be available to you right at the start, but nonetheless is still pretty crucial to understand. So we're gonna start in the top left, as you always do. We're going to go around the border for the user interface. Then we're gonna take a look at the world map and the things that you can glean, the information that you can understand just from here. Then we're going to get into a battle. I'm gonna show you some post or some pre-battle user interface things to check out, some during battle, and then what happens in the aftermath, just to give you a comprehensive view of the game in total. So we're gonna start in the upper left here. This is your standard menu system. One of the things that I do want to mention, there are actually two of them. One of them being if you are a streamer or if you are a YouTuber, you want to turn the streaming mode on. There is licensed music throughout the game, I think primarily post battle, but there is some licensed music that will get you caught you can turn this on so you don't have to worry about it. There are things like movie subtitles, play audio when not in focus. That's always a must for me. So I can alt tab and not have things go away. But one of the other cool things about this is the fact that it has a surround sound system, primarily around unit responses. Now, you may not think that this is absolutely necessary, but it is nice to know whether your units are on the left side of your screen or on the right side if you're not looking straight at them. So I highly recommend doing it. It does add a little bit of immersion, a little bit of a good experience overall and your controls. There's not a ton of controls to consider, but there are some nonetheless, and I think they do add some good relevance. If you are a hotkey person yourself, this is going to be one of the better settings that you can control and you can start figuring out. We're gonna keep that at eight because I don't want to mess with any of that. And that is it. Next up is your encyclopedia. This is a very solid resource. I love games that include encyclopedias because they give you a lot of information about the game you might not know otherwise. Now this uh, game concepts are going to be everything within the game. This is not gonna be abstract information. This is literally going to tell you about information on the game. Highly recommend looking at this if you're confused about a whole range of game concepts. We're not gonna look at this today. And then your military is all the military actions and military units that you can use within the game. These are also really good to figure out because they don't all apply to each other. For instance, the allies don't have access to conscript infantry, but the uh, the ax or not the axis, the the other side. I can't think of what they're called right now. Uh, they, they have access to conscript infantry, whereas the allies don't. The allies have a thing called disunity of command, which I do believe, I can't remember where it is, but essentially if they have different nationalities playing in the same battle, they actually uh, suffer a morale debuff. So that's something to consider. We have different theaters of war, which include mechanics or uh, mechanics around the buildings that you can have, the different things you can do on the world map your different trenches and the different things you can do within trench warfare. And this is more abstract, central powers. That's the word I'm thinking of, apologies on that. Uh, this kind of just gives you some ab abstract information on the game setting itself. It's a comprehensive encyclopedia that's been pretty well thought out. And so I really enjoy it. Moving to the center, top center of your screen is your national will, as well as an indicator on whose turn it is. Obviously, there's only two sides. There's the Allied Nations and the Central Powers. And in this May of 1916, what you have is a reduced amount of uh, national will. If you start at the very beginning, it's going to be higher up, I believe around like 650, maybe even 700. And down here, it's at 450, which means the game progresses a little bit faster, but that's kind of the deal. May 1916 is actually 18 turns into the game. 
So there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's a little more advanced for sure. But regardless, your national will is literally the will of the nations and how you are going to war for them. You lose and or gain national will via battles or events, different things that happen there. Obviously, if you win a much larger battle, you gain a lot more will, national will, while at the same time, the enemy loses a lot of national will. So what I've seen here in my short time playing, I'm bordering on nine hours, 10 hours total, is that it can swing wildly. And that's one thing I want to caution you on. It's not gonna be real easy to just knock out lots and lots of national will against the enemy because they can come right back and punch you right back in the face. But this does give you a very blatant and very good overall indicator of the national will and the things they're in, of course. If you get down to zero, the game is over one way or the other. So you can either conquer the capitals or you can get down national will down to zero. I'm going to say national will down to zero is going to happen more often than not, simply because by the time you're losing multiple regions, unless you're spearheading into Kresnok, uh, you're not going to be able to, to get to that capital before national will runs out. Moving over here to the edge, we have active events as well as an events log. You will have various events that will give you various benefits. You have an objective, a result, and a duration. So for right now, we need to defeat 10 German infantry companies. We will get 500 gold if we do that and for a duration of five turns. So you have five turns to defeat 10 German infantry companies. That's not hard to do. That's essentially a single battle. So it's not going to be a terribly difficult thing. And then, of course, if you want to just see an events log of what's going on throughout your career, that would be a pretty simple way of doing it. Moving down here to the bottom right simply gives you a turn faction as well as your end turn, as well as the date. And if you hover over it, you see the number of turns. We're at 18 turns in 1916. Pretty cut and dry. Your bottom left probably contains the most information out of all of this that's useful to your actual campaign. We're going to start here at the bottom. This is your gold reserves. It's used for all purchases of military units, region structures, missions, or other global items. You gain gold reserves at the start of every turn. The amount of said gold reserves depends on your research. So at the beginning, I think you get something like 1,000 gold per turn. You can bump that up to ballpark, I want to say fourteen to 1,600 a turn, which will be useful. Now, gold reserves are used in a lot of places. They are the purchasing of military units. Your siege artillery, your air wings, and your tanks. Now, one thing to mention here is you cannot buy infantry. Infantry come in at random intervals or as a result of research that has been, or technology that has been researched, different events that have triggered. So there's a lot of ways to gain infantry. You just literally cannot buy them, but you can buy siege artillery, which gives you a, a bombardment X number of days, depending on how much supplies you want to use. So that's very helpful at demoralizing infantry in the mid to late game. You can buy, again, air wings, which will allow you to do a certain range of missions, depending on your research that has been unlocked. And then again, once you research them, tanks. All of those are really good things, but that's not the only thing that gold reserves buy. We'll get into this in uh, greater detail in just a little bit, but region abilities, as well as buildings in your regions are also using your gold reserves. So right here, this will be 700 gold. We could use our region abilities, army intel, or region intel for their amounts of gold as well. That's not all though. At the end of every battle, your troops will automatically replenish to full strength. Now, I don't know that I necessarily agree with this concept because uh, it does make things a little more frustrating. It is much harder to break through and you don't really see the fruits of your labor quite as much in terms of a great victory because they automatically replenish to full. That's neither here nor there though. Probably shouldn't have even mentioned it. But still, your units will replenish to full at the end of every battle, those that are left, and that costs gold. Now, ballpark for even a great victory, if you've lost a lot of units, you're talking anywhere from five to 600 gold to maybe 13 to 1500 gold. The one thing I would caution is not to use your gold reserves nonstop because you do have a limited amount and you can run out very, very quickly. It may not seem like it, but you certainly can. Last but not least, well, at least I think it's last but not least, one of the things you can do with your gold is you can buy national supply. Now I want to separate national supply 
from regional supply. And we'll see that in just a minute. But national supply is your ability to supply any region on the map that can access your national supply. Not everyone can access it. Get into it, but not everyone can access your natural supply. So you want to have a reserves for those that can. This global supply is going to be used in specific regions under specific conditions. But 500 gold will purchase you 200 national supply, and that will help you in your battles, setting up, getting troops out, and hopefully winning said battles. So national supply or global supply is again in battle purchases. We'll get to the regions in just a second, but that is essentially the long and short of it. We are getting into research now. Now you have technology and this later start, you are actually accruing four or two research points every single turn instead of one as in the first one. And your research is um, divided up into six different areas. You have infantry, intelligence, logistics, engineering, trench and flight. Each of them have lots of positivity and lots of ways that they can benefit. But as you probably guessed by now, you're not going to be able to access every single one of these. You're going to have to pick and choose and determine the right path. Now, one thing I will mention is that uh, this does appear to be randomized. Uh, this whole section wasn't unlocked as far as I know uh, from the last time that I looked at this start date. So hopefully it is randomized because that'd be pretty fun. But regardless, these are pretty straightforward. Your infantry affects all of your infantry in various ways from increased damage to um, elite training for a blast yield to gas mass to reduce the effects of gas on them to replenishment and the replenishment cost at the end of every battle. I just mentioned you can very easily waste a ton of money on replenishments at the end of each battle. So a surgical tent for a field hospital level three probably isn't a bad investment. All of these, again, straightforward intelligence involves ways to espionage the other side to sway the public in other ways that you wouldn't be able to. Otherwise, this is very helpful to learn things about the enemy and to sway things on your own side. Logistics is the capability of you logistically um, giving your troops supplies. As I mentioned down here, this is 1200 gold reserves, reduces the gold reserves cost of strategic structures by 200. This gives you the chance to destroy a target in a tactical siege bombardment. 1600 gold reserves there. This allows a supply depot level five of bringing up uh, 1200 supplies. So that's a really good one. If you want to be able to bring a lot to the field to win battles, which is absolutely necessary. All these are absolutely necessary. Why it's a struggle. Engineering involves your siege artillery eventually into tanks. Trench involves trench warfare, whether it be upgraded trenches, as we see here, whether it be different things you can bring during it, like a long range bombardment uh, or your machine guns or down to infantry in a command trench, gain a morale bonus while stationed there. Things of that nature, uh, including gas uh, shells to be able to damage the infantry. And last but certainly not least is flight. Now flight is interesting because you can unlock flight early, but you can't do everything that you need to be able to do to be effective with flight until later on. You can increase the range of blimps while also decreasing their cost. You can get bombing runs. You can start doing, uh, goodness, like uh, strafing runs. There's a whole host of things you can do here that will allow you to effectively use flight, but you do have to pump into it if you're going to get into it. As I mentioned at the beginning of the game, you only get one research point per turn, so you have to use them a little more sparingly. In this 1916 start, we get two research. You can do whatever you want to do. I just wanted to lay those out. That's all of the, uh, what I want to go say, top level user interface elements. This is without you really investing and clicking deep into the game itself. Now we're at the world map and the world map has, is obviously not super uh, involved in terms of the entire world, but this is World War I we're talking about. So first and foremost, one of the things I wanna say is this is a hex based system. You're not going to be moving and conquering territory in a civilization manner or by entire regions like Total War or province systems like you would in Paradox Strategy games. No, this is a hex by hex by hex system. And on the forefront, we can see a lot of things without ever having to click on stuff. Now, you'll notice major regions along the line. You zoom in, everything comes into focus. And without even clicking on things, we can see a lot of information. For one, 
We will go to Compiègne. However you want to say that. I, I don't speak French. You can see a majority of the nations here are going to be French. And in fact, I want to say, yes, the majority is going to be French. We're going to click off. The stars notes how important the region is and also notes how many times it has to be uh, fully, let's see, achieve a full victory. I'll say it like that. You cannot reduce a star without achieving the great victory, which is the highest level victory possible. The only way to get that is to take all the objectives and also the headquarters. That also means that it will require multiple, multiple attempts to take a single region. We have to have a great victory in Noyon, Noyon twice in order to take the region. And that's not a simple thing to do. Now, one thing I'll also mention is that you can regain stars if they haven't seen combat. So if Soissons does not get attacked in this next turn, it will regain a star. You can develop your strategies in a way like this because you could attack Noyon and get a great victory, wait a turn knowing you can't take this again and just attack them again so they don't achieve that star back. That's a valid strategy that I think has a lot of potential to it. But regardless, the stars denote how important those things are. Verdun has four stars. Uh, Dionville has four. I do believe these guys have five. So you're talking about probably needing to completely surround these guys with a large amount of forces to be able to take the capitals. It's going to be a very long battle for those capitals. But if we look here, we can see a majority of these uh, troops are French. They have the stars. And then you also have a little denotation here. This means and notes what buildings are in the region. This is a supply station or a supply depot, which allows you to access the global supply I mentioned earlier that's down here. Poisson has a supply depot and a field hospital. That field hospital allows them to uh, have fewer replenishment or allows greater replenishment. You're not having to pay for as much. And if we were to go in espionage, we would be able to see what they had as well. So that's a big kicker there that I think is really, really cool. We'll get into those region abilities in just a minute. But just so you know, that's kind of the basics from what you can see. You can also give uh, an indicator on what units are there, at least on your side. We could do that again with the other guys in just a minute. But you can tell that we have infantry companies, we have air units, and we have siege artilleries. All of that just from the get-go. So we can just get a really easy glimpse at what places have what information that is crucial to understand to figure things out as best as possible. Now, if we click inside of the regions, it's a whole nother story. We have a lot of information. Pompeña is a three-star region. If we lose it, we will lose 12 will. Now, not only that, but with each subsequent battle, if we lost three stars, it's 12 national will minus whatever has happened to the national will after those battles, meaning you could lose a ton of national will in order and lose a region that way. That would be awful. Hopefully it will never happen to you. But regardless, that's what it means. On the top here, we have region morale. Now, morale goes down or up based on certain events or certain modifiers. There's a lot of different ways that morale can go up and down. One of the easiest ways that it can go down is by battle fatigue. And we can tell here by the regions that have smoke and fire coming out of them, which ones have been attacked previously, uh, including ours. Nope, none of ours have. But if you'll look here, if we were to click on each one of those that kind of has the fire burning in it, which denotes a battle, you'll see they all have minus 15 morale. That's battle fatigue. We don't receive the battle fatigue, I would assume, because we won. But regardless, if we were to attack um, Perron again with, say, Valer Bertunu, we would get, they would get minus 30 morale, assuming they lost. Arras would go in and we would get minus 45 morale. It does stack and it can be detrimental in a really fantastic way to relentlessly harp on an enemy to be able to take a good region quickly. If we were to attack relentlessly here, it would be so low in morale that you probably wouldn't even have to put infantry in. You could just use some artillery and make them all scatter. So that's an important thing to you. Of course, if you don't get attacked, not only do you gain a star back, but you also have your morale that goes up. So it's something to think about. 
This is what I was talking about earlier, and we're finally addressing it. Your supply pipeline versus your regional supply. Your regional supply is the sum of all supplies in which the units that are in them bring to the table. So if we take a look here, we have four infantry, French infantry corps here. So each corps is comprised of 20 infantrymen, one heavy artillery and one light artillery, meaning that the entire infantry corps here is bringing in 80 total infantry, four heavy and four light artillery. But each corps also brings in 180 supplies. So 180 times four, that's 720 supplies, right? We go over here, we see we have a siege artillery battery. They don't bring any combat supply. But we also see we have two French air wing uh, corps here. And because of that, they each bring in 100. 720 plus 200 is 920 regional supply. But because we have a supply depot, we have supply depot one brings in 400 supplies from the global supply system. If we were to use all of that, which we probably would in a battle like this, we would get our global supply, it would decrease by the amount that we used in the supply pipeline. If we go here and we spend 700 bucks on Supply Depot 2, we see that bumps up to 600 supplies. So we now have 1,520 supply to use, but it would take away a lot from this global supply. Make sense? Hopefully it does, and it all is hunky-dory. Now, we do have units in this box. We'll be moved to a new region, so let's go to Calais. We're going to address it there, which has a huge amount of supplies, I might add. Left clicking brings in one core. Right clicking brings in all of the cores that are in the selected box. So we're going to bring, uh, let's go all of our British units and we're gonna put them in, uh, let's put them in Arras, right? So we have all of these guys selected and we are going to right, or, yeah, right click and they will move to Arras but there's a kicker. You'll notice that they are locked. That means in this current turn, we cannot use these nine cores. It takes the next turn to be able to use them. So you can't, uh, you can't move everyone into one region to go attack a guy and just try and wipe them out in one single turn. It doesn't work like that. Next turn, we'll have quite a few cores here uh, that we will be able to maybe take Peron with or at least be able to push them a little bit harder than we did before. All right, moving on, we're gonna go back to Campania. We have region abilities. Now there are four region abilities that we can do. There is region intel, which we did up here to find out what buildings are in Ghent, Odenard, and Lille. Your army intel, if we were to do the same thing, we have money to spare. Your army intel will give you the almost, well it's supposed to anyways, will tell you the region core. Oh, it failed, that's why. If we were to go, nope, we can't do it, okay. So it failed, that's unfortunate. But if we if we had been successful, we would see the exact army composition of these guys, which would be very helpful to determine whether we wanna push them. Or uh, it's unfortunate that it didn't work, but such is the nature of these things, they're not scripted on my end. We have region abilities, which is region intel, army intel, counter intel, which removes any enemy espionage missions in the target region, prevents new ones for a period of time, which is good. So if you know you've been seen or you're trying to cover up what you're putting into a region, then this would be a good way to do it. And then last, care packages. Care packages are clothing, food, and other items which reduce the negative morale. So they will increase morale in a region for your troops. And that is, of course, unlocked technology. Last but certainly not least, you have uh, your buildings. Obviously each building does their own thing. Airfields affect airplanes. Your field hospital reduces the number of casualties. Your mechanic garage affects the, your tanks. Your field supply depot increases the amount of supplies you can bring in. You have a safe house for agents, which reduces the chance of them getting caught. And then you have a canteen, which will do positive buffs for your soldiers. These are all unlocked via research, so you'll have to determine what you want to put in. But again, remember, you can't build everything in every region because you don't have the gold reserve to do so. But one last thing that I do want to mention that is outside of the region when you select it, you'll notice rain or you'll notice snow, you'll notice different things overall. If you were to click on them, you will see on the left-hand side, 
different buffs or debuffs. So for instance, this is the rainy season. It's continuous rainfall has reduced the battlefield to a sea of mud. Movement speeds and artillery damage are reduced. All air missions are grounded. That is half the reason why I moved my airplanes to Arras instead of Haysbrook, because I wasn't sure if the rain would be done and that would make my planes useless. These are very important to read and to figure out and to understand so you can see what's going on in your regions and determine whether you want to battle that turn or whether you don't. All right, so we need to take out 10 German infantry companies. I am going to have Arras attack Perón, and that brings us one of our last world map user interface elements before we go into a battle. This is the pre-battlefield deployment section. This gives a list of everything we have here. It gives a list, or if we had the intelligence, it would let us know what's in here. Odds are what's in here is the same thing as this. So they have 40 infantry units. They have two heavy artillery and two light artillery, because that's pretty much the standard core. Now we only have 940 available supplies. So it honestly, honestly may not be the best unless we were to increase our supply depot. So then we could go do that. Attention. Or we could go here with Villers Bretonneau and we could up that as well and attack with five cores instead of three. I feel like that would be a little bit better and we have a lot higher supply. So let's do that. We are the attacker, they are the defender. They have two cores, again, 40 units versus my 100 and less uh, artillery as well. So we can cancel as I did. You can see the battle fatigue, which will affect them greatly. Now we could auto resolve. I will say the auto resolve is very brutal in this game. And I wouldn't auto resolve unless it was 15 cores against one core. Something you know without a shadow of a doubt will be a great victory for you. Because otherwise it's not going to end well and you're going to probably pay a lot more for it. Or we can engage in the battle, which is what we are going to do. This is pretty cut and dry, so I'll see you on the battlefield. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, on the battlefield. Now I'm going to do what we normally do. We're going to go all the way around in a simple way, and then we'll address the things that are on the actual battle map. We've been here before with the menu and the encyclopedia, so we're not going to do that. This is quite literally, you can begin the battle if you wanted to. You can begin the battle with absolutely nothing done. I've done it before. I highly recommend you don't do it because it's embarrassing and it just makes things a lot more stressful. But we're going to start with a map over here. Now, the map is toggleable. I recommend having the highest map size because it simply allows you to see the map a little bit better. And we have a lot of things here. For one thing, each cross here is a spawn point that brings in troops. So at, at any point, if we were to capture Y, we could bring in troops from this point, even though it was on their side. We'll get to that in just a little bit, though. This gives you a detail of everything that's going on. We can see here that we have quite a few. Uh, no man's land is definitely no man's land. Uh, it, it's real bad. We can see we have some forests over here to each side and then all the squiggly lines. We can see at least where their trenches are before the battle it may not be like that after once we get started, but you never know. There are a few things to consider. One, these are the control points. Control point Y, control point X are the enemies. A and B are ours. Now this will get you a great victory. I think I messed up earlier. Uh, I do believe controlling both may give you a great victory. I can't remember to be completely. But for sure the guaranteed way to get a great victory is to capture all three. So you have your control point Y, control point X, and the central powers HQ, which isn't gonna be an easy one to take. But nonetheless, we have the same thing. We have A, B, and our HQ. And you can see the trench lines on the map as well. Those are pretty obvious things that we can do. It's going to remind us of our mission objectives if they are relevant to a battle. So we do need to defeat 10 German infantry companies. They'll have the counter there, which we should be able to do today. Down on the bottom, we have things to address. Now, this is more relevant once we actually start the battle. But when you bring reinforcements in, they will automatically start out in column formation. Column formation brings them all very close together, in which case they move faster. But if they get hit by artillery, they are guaranteed to pretty much get wiped out. Skirmish formation is the opposite. They are spread out, in which case they are slower, but they are less affected by uh, when they come under fire. So that's something to consider as well. Your company halt, you can tell them to halt immediately where they are which will give you a whistle, or you can hit backspace. I do know that for sure. 
And then you have company withdrawal. If a if a infantry company is near death, rather than lose points by having a trench taken while they're in it or having them die in battle, you can withdraw them. It does still penalize you for withdrawing them, but at least it's not as bad and you're not wasting slots, as we see over here, our cap. You're not wasting them on units that are pretty much guaranteed to die. And then of course we will have our artillery in various uh, various phases here in just a second. We come over to the bottom left. This is your most important part of the user interface elements on the top front side. This gives you your troop deployment, your support or your trenches and your support structures before the battle starts. Your trenches will depend on your research. Right here we see we have a pretty good amount of trenches. I'm not going to build anymore. But what you can see, we're going to skip to the battlefield just real quick. You can remove the trench or upgrade to another trench. For instance, these are all one. Uh, they only allow one group of infantry soldiers in. So I'm going to upgrade at least those right now to uh, try and take those and make those a little more effective. Those will hold two infantry units, although only one will fire. And you can see again, based on your technology, what you've got. I recommend some calm trenches. Being able to uh, go in between different trenches without having to worry about it, especially in a defensive battle, is one of the best parts that you can do to protect yourself. We all need protection. Support structures here are pretty straightforward. An MG nest. This is a machine gun nest, which is very, very effective. I will say that. One thing I will say, if you are able to in a defensive battle, is you want multiple layers of MG nest because they are incredibly effective. And having the artillery the enemy artillery, waste them on your MG nest is a well worthwhile. Field mortars are much like MG nests, minus the fact that they are 360 degrees and they provide field mortars, mortars, which is suppression. So that's a really good thing. Your barbed wire is pretty straightforward. You're going to add some barbed wire in there. Your heavy field artillery obviously features some very heavy packing punches. We're going to put three of them in here. And you'll also notice that when we laid those down, one, you see the map coverage in the top right. That's going to tell you where you can are able to shoot. But also each artillery counts towards your command cap. So you want to be able to balance things a, a little, a little well. I like three and three personally. If I had a lot more supply, I'd put in a lot more supply, but I don't. So it is what it is. So you have your heavy artillery, which is suppresses and causes actual damage. Your light artillery will simply suppress and that's it, which is fine. That's a very good thing. Next up are your OBS balloons. These are going to be your observational balloons that are going to be very, very crucial if you want to be able to map out attacks. And again, you can see it's a 360 degree effect that will uh, you can see in the top right corner. You do have a, uh, a limit to where you can place with anything. So keep that in mind as well. So those are your support structures and your trenches. Both are equally valuable, depending on what battles you're going into. If you had any range of troops outside of just your regular infantry, all of your troops, including your tanks, would show up here. So you can deploy them if you want to. You can deploy tanks pre-battle. It just costs quite a bit. Now you'll notice here that if you hovered over the British infantry, it comes up with a basic description and then a nationality bonus. So for instance, the British infantry have 10% additional rifle uh, rifle and vision range. It allows them to be a little bit more deadlier than the enemy. If I were to so select them, you could only pre-battle place troops and trenches, which is another reason why I upgrade, because I can have more. And so they only cost five apiece pre-battle, so we're going to... We're literally just going to fill up our, our trenches with men and you can see there we are running low on our pre battle supply there we go we hit our limit we are at 30 out of 30 we have 76 uh troops remaining or at least uh brigades of whatever you want to call those and they cost five now but there's nothing else that we can do now one we thing i will mention orders. that is we can before the battle starts we, we can group orders. our troops Stand by for orders. Ready yourselves. which is simply control and then group Attention. number 
We have new orders. Now, you'll notice I'm not doing one we and two, and the reason why I don't do one and two is because those are reserved for my artillery, which for some for weird orders. reason does not have the ability to uh, take on artillery in groups until the actual battle starts. So we have our troops laid out. We have everything laid out as best that we can. If we had siege artillery, we could, for a certain number of supplies, bombard the enemy, quote unquote, before the battle begins. We don't have that. So here we go and we're gonna begin the battle. All right, we are paused because we're getting ready to do all the things. The battle has officially begun and the timer up here, as well as this is of great significance. So right now we have our control points on each side. The Germans have lost, I'm assuming because of morale, that that's actually the fact that it's starting to trickle down. This is the balance of power. This is how much power we have based on our supply, based on morale, based on the points taken, based on other things of that. So we can see that the Germans don't have a whole lot, but that doesn't mean they're any less deadly uh, because they have the capabilities. They have really trenched up massively since the pre-battle. They have barbed wire on two of their uh, points. So it's going to be a very difficult trudge up to these guys. Now, personally for me, I probably should switch over to this side, but we're gonna try and make this work as best as we can. But regardless, you have your timer, your sides and their power, and this is kind of an indicator of how the battle is progressing. So we can see right now it's in the Germans' favor, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. We'll see if we can't do our best. Now, the only things that have really changed elsewhere is one, our deployment is shown up. I can finally make groups one and two, which is just a personal thing for me to be able to more easily be able to, to shoot uh, and shoot from the hip regarding that. We have our troops here. We can raise our observational balloons whenever we hit play. And were we to have any air support, we could do air, um, air raids or whatever functions that we have researched in order to do that. We don't have that, so we are going to hit play. And we are going to see the observational balloons in action. There we go. So now we hit pause again, and we can see the layout of the enemy troops. Now over here, there are significantly less troops. So it would be smart to go after this point first. So that's a little bit disappointing because I already had all my things. But the good thing is we can just simply rename all of these troops to be the ones that are over on this side. And then those guys can just chill over there. But one of the things we have to consider is bombardment and all of that stuff. If we hover over any of these units, first and foremost, you can see their health, their unit type and the nationality they belong to. Over here, if we select infantry, and this will be relevant for any non-artillery, you can see things like damage reduced because they're in a trench, the total number of soldiers in the company. I said battalion earlier or brigade, their technical term is company. And then their morale and cover rating. Morale is important once it gets too low, they will retreat and they will run away. Your cover is obviously your cover. They have a 40% cover being in these trenches. So we have to think about that. And this is where the formations come into play as well. So what we are going to do, I'm gonna do one single barrage to kind of show you what I do for funsies. And then we will go to the end of the battle where things actually, no, we do, we will come back when I'm close to capturing a point because I do wanna show you what that looks like and the systems that come into there. So we're gonna do one uh, where you're going to play and we're gonna do what my favorite tactic is and that's just to start hammering the holy heck out of them. And we don't have a ton of supplies. So we do have to consider that. Now, heavy infantry or heavy artillery have three attacks. They have precision barrage, gas attack, and air burst. Technologies need to be unlocked in order to accomplish that. Your light artillery have suppression barrage, which prevents the enemy from actually attacking you. Rolling barrage or smoke shot. So be aware of those. Those are the only two artillery inside of a battle that you can functionally use. And what we can do is we can wait until the artillery get up again and we can start using i have six artillery basically that can all suppress this entire region and hopefully it will work it may not work it may end disastrously we'll have to see but we do want to wait for those guys to come out and start working a little faster so if you hover over this this is an indicator of your trenches you can hold two units in these trenches now this means that we are going to have to fight to go get them Attention. 
but you can simply click in here and it'll be right as rain we are going to have eight and nine come over here i think we'll be okay otherwise and this is a matter of timing you have to be able to time this thing correctly and you can see they have a barrage going Something we have to be consistently aware of. We're going to pull these guys back. They don't get hit. But you can see there a dev how devastating uh, morale can be hit simply by rocking that. All right, cool. We got three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Hopefully those guys, they'll, they'll be fine. We are going to barrage those guys so they can't attack me anymore. We're going to barrage those guys so they can't attack me. And we're also going to barrage these guys. Now, the area barrage is pretty darn wide overall. So you want to kind of carpet bomb until you have a, uh, a rolling barrage. You want to be able to try and hit everything at once with as much possibility for success. You're never going to hit everything, unfortunately. And then it's just a manner of who can fire back at you first. Well, so far, this seems like a pretty successful um, attempt. Relatively successful. Believe it or not, this was actually a pretty successful attack. Most of my attacks do not uh, nearly go this well. There we go. So that's a that's a, a a little bit of a glimpse on how these operate. Again, we got to keep be mindful of your supplies, and we can see there that people are starting to come in, which we should be able to attack them. Nope, they are barraging us, which is very rude. So it takes a lot to be able to do all of this stuff because it is a concerted attack that requires a heckin' lot of coordination. And in no way is it a simple process. So we basically need to make sure that we can take out this guy. We take out the mortars will be really good and then coming over here because I did not oh we're gonna lose that unit you can see how fast they melt as well there we go actually I can move these guys and put them here awesome there we go all right so this gives you an idea on what it's like to have to deal with all this stuff and we can even target the enemy's artillery to prevent them from attacking us that's something that's very valid to do and i think it's going to take one more dedicated hit to knock out that mortar all right so we lost five units in that initial thing so it's something to just uh, think about whenever you're working on these attacks and you can see here this is a this is a, a layout of everything that's going on in terms of points wise you can see we've lost a lot more than they have all right guys i'm going to come back after a few more attempts at trying to uh not fail and once i have this control point in we'll be ready to rumble in the jungle so i can show you what that looks like all right ladies and gentlemen we are back and finally after some very poor failed attempts at trying to capture a control point we have officially gotten there their artillery is absolutely relentless and i applaud them for their abilities to do things effectively we have very few supplies left but we have taken a control point and there are no more units in an area the control point or no more enemy units in an area the control point moves forward towards the side that controls the area go figure one thing to note is that this is crucial to winning some battles, uh, whether you cease fire after this, which we probably will or not, and it also pauses the timer for however long it's contested. If it goes back and forth, 
and it goes back and forth. It does not matter. All that matters we have new orders. is that time has stopped while it is being tested. Now, of course, once it stops being contested one way or the other, then timer starts back down again. So you can see that that move switched us up quite a bit. But what we can do now is we can move our troops, knowing that they are uh, relative safety. And we are behind enemy lines, so we can take out this artillery. You will get uh, points rewarded to you for taking out enemy artillery. So it is very, very advantageous to do so, even if you simply just take out the artillery and nothing else, and then cease fire afterwards. These, these are all valid tactics that I think have a great deal of relevance. Good strategy overall. We see them slowly taking things out one by one. I don't think it would take quite that many grenades. It may take a, a lot less, but nonetheless. This will help us greatly. If we can take out the other ones, I do believe those are the only two artillery they have on the map. Check your ammo. We're going to go with number three. I don't want them to be come under to come under fire, so we're going to lava some granados and then go back. There we go. And then we're going to offer our ceasefire, which basically says we're done. We're going to be done. We're going to offer that ceasefire. They will accept. They always accept the ceasefire. Have to accept it. We're going to continue and go into the post-battle scene. This is the post-battle scene. There's a lot to do here. All right. So for one, this sways you one way or the other towards a great victory or a great loss. We did not do enough to warrant anything but a stalemate. So we ended up both losing national will. It is what it is, unfortunately, for us. However, our losses and replenishment costs were only 572 gold. As I mentioned, at the end of every battle, it automatically does it. Our attacker base score was a lot lower as well than theirs. They have to pay 866. So if you can do enough damage, I think uh, there's a valid strategy to kind of bankrupt the central powers or the allies, depending on who you're playing as, because that's a good, good strategy there. We can see overall uh, from the amount of casualties we gave, including the types, as well as the objectives. So we controlled one point, we captured two trench uh, emplacements and melee combat victories. They had a lot more trench melee victories, so that attributed than them. We lost more than they did, that's okay. But then we have battle honors. This is uh, starting with command medal. Granted to those that overwhelm the enemy against all odds, the greater the difference between the player and enemy scores, the higher the bonus. So we get gold for higher uh, bonuses. We had like 4,000 points compared to their 1620. Life medals granted to those that preserve the life. It's a measure of the ratio between companies deployed and companies lost. Lower the ratio, the higher the bonus. You have perseverance. It's a measure of the max morale for tro troops deployed versus the total morale left at the end of the battle. So we actually, this will be a complete stalemate. No one gains or loses national will because of this. We have our efficiency model. It's the ratio between the percentage of the supply versus the score gained from spending. We didn't do quite as well as they did, that's okay. But it's still a good measure anyways. The battlefield domination medal. This is earned by capturing all of the control points, but not the HQ. That's a distinction that needs to be made. And the total victory is earned by capturing and holding all control points and command trenches on the map. So this is holding X, Y, and the HQ. So as we'll see here when we go to the world map, we will see that it is a complete stalemate. No one gained anything. We lost or we spent 638 supply which comes out of our supply. Replenishment cost 572, so we lost 572 gold. That really didn't do anything outside to give us the objective we completed. Told you it wasn't very difficult. And now they have minus 30 region morale, and we have minus 15. So I did have a, I did mess up there. After a, a battle, we do end up losing morale. Both sides do. But now if we were to attack with Arras, which wouldn't be a good idea overall, because we don't have the troops for it, uh, we would they would suffer minus 30 morale from battle fatigue right off the bat. Ladies and gentlemen, that is essentially everything that I have for you regarding a user interface tutorial. That is going to be the end of this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. 
Hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it was informational. And I hope that you were able to play the game just a little more efficiently because of it. I want to thank you all for hanging around. There will be more Great War Western Front videos here in the near future. So keep an eye out on the channel. And I'll see you in the next one.